So we're good to go. So let's get started because uh, we realized the first time we did this that we have a lot to cover and we're going to really fill up the hour. So let's get things started. First of all, just a little bit of mechanics. Uh, yeah, we've seen that you, uh, you uh, ask questions through the questions control panel. Uh, I don't have an exact count of how many people are going to be with us today, but it's probably going to be somewhere between five and six hundred folks with us but, uh, for this afternoon. So uh, that's why the, we'll do our best to answer your questions. Uh, if by chance we're unable to get to all the questions live, uh, they do get recorded and we'll do our best to get back to you. This webinar is being recorded, so we're going to go over a lot of information, and some of it may fly by a little quick, and you may miss something and, and uh, want to go over something again. So after the webinar is completed, generally 24 hours after, we send out an email to let everybody know any kind of special offers that were made, etc. Also with a, uh, and a second email that will tell you where the recorded webinar lives so that you can then review it at your leisure. Today's webinar is sponsored by both Blurb and XWrite. Both sites have a lot of great educational information. Uh, if you have some technical questions after this is all done, uh, first place to look would be on both of these websites. And I am your host today. My name is Joe Brady. I am the uh, webinar marketing manager for the Mac Group in Elmsford, New York, which is about, oh, about 35 miles north of Manhattan. We're having a rather warm, humid day today. It's in the 90s. I knew it was going to be a problem when 9 o'clock this morning I pulled in the office and it was already 90 degrees. So I'm staying in the cool air conditioning and uh, just spending the afternoon with you folks today. Uh, as the webinar marketing manager, what I do is create and present educational materials for professional photographers. I'm also the co-owner of Dragonfly Studio in Tuxedo, New York and I've been photographing wedding portrait and commercial work for over 20 years. I also lead photography workshops around the country and will be doing, using some images from a just completed workshop uh, to put together our sample book today. The uh, reason I tell you this is just to kind of illustrate that I use these tools that I'm going to show you in my everyday work and in the past I've probably run into the same uh, photography color problems that, that you all have experienced. Since I put a color workflow system into place I've eliminated the frustration of getting back prints and books with less than great color. So by using a few handy tools and following a few guidelines, you can be sure that the books you get will have great color, and that's what I want to share with you today. Now, uh, we are doing Lightroom to BookSmart today. Uh, so BookSmart being the application that you download from Blurb if you haven't already done so. And Lightroom that I'm going to be showing you today is Lightroom 3. Uh, I'll discuss the few parts of Lightroom 3 that are new that do not exist in earlier versions. Uh, however, if you have Lightroom 2, uh, it isn't always the case, but in this case, you're really going to want to upgrade because there is some incredibly cool stuff in there uh, that really got me hooked pretty much immediately. So uh, consider yourself warned if you download the trial. But it's gonna, if you already own two, version 2 or 2.7 or 2.6, whatever you're up to, uh, the 99 bucks will be... Uh, well spent. So, before we get started, and kind of as a, an impetus to let you know if you're not aware of this, um, there is a contest going on now called Photography Book Now. And uh, Suzanne, are you there? I am here. So Suzanne, would you like to tell everybody about the uh, Photography Book Now contest? Sure. Well, thanks everybody for being here today. I uh, wanted to make sure that everybody knew about our Photography Book Now competition. There's only three weeks left to get your photography book into the competition, and it's your chance to win $25,000. So don't delay and enter as soon as you can. You can find out all the information and even get some inspiration from other PBN entrants at pbn.blurb.com. Very good. There's some incredible quality stuff here. Uh, so even if you're not going to enter the competition, I highly recommend that you go take a look at the website and you get to see some really cool ideas and some very incredible work. So by all means, it's worth a visit. So what are we going to cover today? First of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about one of my favorite little tools, the Color Checker Passport from X-Rite. Uh, this thing makes getting great color easier than you ever imagined. Uh, with the Passport, we're going to go over white balancing the camera, creating a custom camera profile, and then using some creative enhancements. Once I put the Passport in my photography workflow, the hours that it saved me, um, 
uh, made this an indispensable tool for me. Then after we get our color right, we're going to take a look at some of the new features in Lightroom 3 that will improve the quality of your images um, in some ways that are absolutely incredible. And when that's completed, we're going to export our photos for placement into Blurb's BookSmart application, and we're going to build a book to send a Blurb for printing. Before we get started, however, we have to do something first, and we've got to make sure our monitor is showing us the accurate color and tone in our images. And this is really important because before you can do any serious editing, it's really important that the monitor is calibrated and profiled. Every editing decision you make, be it color or tonal range or brightness, is going to be made based on the image you see on your display. So it's got to be correct if you're going to make any informed decision. Now this process is fast and easy. It's very simple, uh, but the payoffs are substantial. Now doesn't matter what system you're using for calibrating your monitor. There's only a handful out there anyway at this point. But make sure you use something. You've got to have hardware and software to do this. You cannot do this stuff by eye. Now I'm going to show you the Color Monkey photo. Now the reason I use the Color Monkey is because it does more than just monitors. It does my monitor. It allows me to create custom printer profiles for my printer. And it also allows me to calibrate my uh, projector. I use my projector a lot for both speaking and for presenting images to clients. And by using the Color Monkey, I can create a profile for my projector so that I can not have to apologize for the color in it. So when my projector is set up, it looks exactly like my monitor does, is. So I'm going to jump real quick into, actually going to go into the Color Monkey software, and I'm going to do a real quick monitor profile just so you can see the process. Now some of you may have seen this before. I've done this in previous webinars, but it's really important, so I'm just going to do it real quick. The whole process takes less than two minutes. So simply, I'm going to click on Profile on my display. I'm using a MacBook Pro laptop right now to present to you, so that's what I'm going to run. And I like to set my luminance at around, a one, at around 100. The problem with most monitors is out of the boxes are way too bright. And if you judge your image on a way too bright monitor, typically what happens is you're going to get it back in your book or off your print, and it's going to be way too dark because your monitor is set too bright. So if you click on here, you see a range of 80 to 140. 100 is a good setting for a laptop. Uh, you might find if it's, you're in a bright room, you're going to have to turn it up. But do your final edits on a, on a room that's somewhat dimmer light, and don't go over 100 if at all possible. And D65 or 6500K is our white point. So I click on Next, and it asks me to calibrate the Color Monkey. So I just flip it to that position and click. And what it does is basically it's doing its own custom white balance. Uh, and this is important because now it has a standard by which to go. And it will then ask to be put on the screen. And it's now ready for that. So I simply hang it on the screen. Unfortunately, you can't see this part but it's just literally just hanging on the front of my screen. I click Next and off it goes. And it's not going to really ask for much input from me at this point. Uh, it's going to do its thing. Now, you can uh, use this uh, somebody asks about CRTs. If you still have a CRT, um, yes, it works just fine. You just choose LCD monitor. Uh, it really has more to do with brightness and uh, contrast range as the setting goes. So you can see the first thing it does is it checks my brightness. And I asked it to be 100 and it came in at 176. So my monitor is set too bright right now for me to accurately judge prints. So I need to turn the brightness down. So I'll just hit the brightness down button a couple of times and until I get it down kind of into this this green area up here. Now laptop jumps are pretty big. You know, they, they gen jump 15 to 20 points each time you hit the button. So if I can get it just kinda in here, I'm at 95, that's great. Then I click Next. So that was the calibration part. The calibration is setting your brightness, your contrast, your gamma, and your color temperature. Now it's doing the profiling part. So what happens is the software sends up a known color to the screen. For example, here comes 100% green. Let's say for argument's sake that the device reads the color that actually shows up and it's not 100% green. Let's say it's, for argument's sake, 95% green and 5% uh, blue that all gets recorded and that's what the profile is built upon. Basically a profile is just a set of corrections. So the next time we're in Lightroom and we ask for 100% green on the screen, uh, that goes through the profile and the profile 
says, well, remember, if you really want 100% green, you got to take out 5% blue. And then 100% green really shows up on the screen. I'm oversimplifying a bit, but in essence, that's really what's going on. It's very simple to do. And it's actually uh, pretty fast. It's actually almost done. Uh, that's one or two more screens, and this will be the last one. Now, something that does happen for some of you, uh, somebody mentioned IMAX. Uh, some, some computers are way too bright. Uh, it just happens. Oh, by the way, after it's done. Uh, I can set a reminder for one, two, three, or four weeks. I have a schedule. I do my monitors every two weeks, so I don't need to be reminded. Click Next. It'll give you a before and after, which in my case, nothing changes because this monitor was profiled about an hour ago. And I'm done. That's Now we know that our monitor is accurately showing us the color. Now, for those of you that do have a screen that is too bright, does happen. Sometimes you have a monitor, you just can't get it down low enough. So what you do with whatever calibration system you're using is get it as low as you can. There are utilities online for both Windows and the Mac OS that will further dim displays. The problem is they change color when they do it. So what I would recommend is judge your color with the brightness turned up, and then you can turn that utility on um, to judge your brightness. Now, someone asks why you need to do this every two weeks. The problem is monitors drift. Uh, depending on the temperature of the room, depending on how long they've been on, they have a tendency to get brighter the longer you've been on, unless you have a really good graphics display. And that means you spent some serious money for it. Generally, $900 to $2,000 is the range. Uh, when you're in that kind of level of monitor, they're more sophisticated and require calibration less often. Generally, the less expensive the display, the more drifting is going to happen. So that's why you got to keep doing this. So, now we now know our monitor is good to go. Now we want to make sure that we have a good basis to get our prints correct. And this is where the passport comes in. As I said before, once I started using the passport in my shooting, the time that it saved me, really the first day I used it, it paid for itself. And I also said this earlier, uh, I'm going to risk sounding like Billy Mays, and yes, I really miss his commercials. I thought they were annoying at first, but now that he's gone, don't you all miss him? It's really a shame. Uh, this simple to use tool uh, has become my absolute favorite accessory uh, when I shoot for the day. So please indulge me and uh, let me show you what the targets uh, do for you. Uh, and again, a couple of you are asking me specifically about a very specific monitor use. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, give you an email when we're done and you can send me an email and uh, we can discuss it privately rather than get into specific uh, monitor favorites. So let's take a look at the targets that are in the passport because again once I started using this uh, it's become absolutely indispensable and I don't I feel naked with doing a shoot without it at this point. So the first part is what's called the color checker and you've probably seen this before. It ex it's existed for years in various different forms. Uh, there's the mini color checker, there's the old big gray tag Macbeth color checker and then the new x ray color checker. They are all exactly the same thing. And what they do is they give you 24 patches that have grayscale, RGB, CMYK, and a handful of colors representing natural objects. Now, the new power of this target is the ability to create a custom profile for your camera for use in Lightroom and in Photoshop. Having a camera profile, which was really difficult in the past, uh, will allow you to get back all the color your camera captured with just one click. I can't make this important enough. Wait till you see when we go into Lightroom and you'll see see what I mean. Now in the past all we th all we had was a white balance. We thought if we had a correct white balance then uh, we were good to go. And it turns out that the uh, raw conversions that are taking place in both Lightroom and Photoshop are causing us to lose a lot of color. Uh, that required a lot of edits in the past to get the saturation back. And unfortunately it wasn't uniform over the color spectrum. There were certain colors that ended up being uh, uh, converted that were weaker than others. So uh, you'll see this live in a minute. And somebody actually just asked an interesting question. Uh, and I've ran into somebody on a trail once. Yes, if you're colorblind, this will in one click uh, bring your colors back. And to really take advantage of this you have to be shooting in RAW. Uh, JPEG shooters, your color balance and your uh, profile are embedded into the file as soon as it's saved. So you do miss out on the profile part, but you do get the color reference part, and we'll see this a little more uh, in detail. Now, white balance, I just mentioned this before. White balance is, of course, still important, and it's part of it. Uh, you, you 
use white balance and profiles together. Now having a spectrally neutral target, whatever your favorite white balance tool is, is going to give you a solid base which you can make adjustments on. The reason I like using the target in the color checker is because I have it with me all the time. It's a small little target, it's got a hard plastic case and it just fits in my pocket. Now to do white balance on your camera, it's different from model to model. And people always ask, oh, do I have to fill the screen? Uh, with the card and the answer is no. The current crop of cameras, uh, I'm currently shooting a uh, Canon 5D Mark II, only asks that the center focusing circle be filled with the white, the neutral reference, and that's all it asks for. So what I typically do is I just hold it at arm's length and take a photo of it um, in the light that I'm working in. Now if you're a JPEG shooter, white balance is very important, uh, doing a custom white balance, because the color temperature is immediately going to be embedded in the file, which means you have less editing latitude later on. Now if you're a raw shooter, and if you're working in Lightroom, you should definitely be a raw shooter because there's practically no advantage uh, to shooting a JPEG if you're a Lightroom person because it makes raw workflow so easy. Um, but there are still two advantages. Since Lightroom checks to see what white balance was used at the original capture, um, it will automatically apply that to your images. So having a custom white balance set means that that step is already done. You don't have to go looking for a white reference image. Secondly, when you're doing your photography, the image on your camera's display, even if you're shooting RAW, is a JPEG that's been processed using your camera's settings. So if your white balance is set right, then the image on your camera's screen is going to have the best color possible as well. Now the third and last target in the system is the Creative Enhancement target. And it has a couple of uh, cool reference pieces in it, so let's take a look at those in a little more detail. Now first, the top row is simply a rainbow. It's a U-saturation luminance level that is used as a color reference. Now this bottom one is handy if you're checking exposure. If you turn on your exposure warnings on your uh, camera's LCD screen, um, You'll, and set your blinkies on, in essence is what we always call them, you'll see if you have a overexposure, uh, you'll see how many of these uh, squares start to blink. Uh, so there's a warning for your exposure. And, oh, somebody mentioned something, well, they mentioned something dear to my heart that is also uh, something I have to mention. Somebody asked, why can't I just use auto white balance? Oh, I'm going to plead with you all. That was a stake through my heart. I'm going to plead with you all, never, ever, ever use auto white balance again. The problem with auto white balance is it recalculates what white or neutral is for every shot you take. Uh, and if you're ever going to try to stitch together a panoramic image and you're on auto white balance, I guarantee that the blue sky from frame to frame is going to change. Uh, so, going to be a big problem. Stay away from auto white balance. If you need to use a preset, pick one that's a standard. If it's daylight out, choose sunny. Uh, if it's cloudy, choose cloudy. It's easier for you to make some kind of global adjustment to an entire set of images rather than try to adjust the white balance of each image individually. So uh, stay away from auto white balance, please, please. So the uh, other two rows of this target are designed for warming and cooling your images. Now, the top one is designed for portraits, the bottom for landscapes. And as a reference in each of these uh, lines, the ones highlighted in yellow here are actually neutral. You could white balance off of those. And these are warming patches. And if you click on these, they get the image will get successively warmer as you move from left to right. And then these last two are for cooling. So to show you the practical application of that, uh, here we see two images with the standard white balance applied. And again, the top portrait row, the far left one is neutral. The landscape row, the middle one is neutral. If we click on a couple of patches in on the top row and apply a white balance in there. Uh, you'll see with that warming patch, which is called warming patch number two, it's two in, you can see the skin tones have gotten warmer. Uh, it makes for a very nice skin if the skin was just too cool for the light you're using. And then for landscapes, if I white balance off of uh, the cooling patch one, you can see that the colors shift. <clears throat> the blues and greens will become more blue and green. So um, if you have maybe less than perfect lighting conditions, or if your white balance when you originally created was set a little wrong, this gives you a reference that you can get that back. Before we jump into Lightroom, just here's my kind of workflow for the day. 
First, make sure your exposure is correct. Having an accurate exposure is important for both your color and your contrast. Now, we digital camera users had been taught in previous years, oh, you were better off underexposing a little bit because then you had the safety of not uh, blowing out your images. Well, that's actually kind of wrong with today's cameras and particularly if you're shooting raw. You're better off being right or maybe even slightly over. Uh, you just don't want to be too far over. The reason for that is there's much more data in the bright side of your image. And if you underexpose, you're going to introduce a lot of noise and artifacts into your image. And I'll show you an image that's slightly underexposed and what Lightroom 3 can do for it. So then I will shoot a white balance card to get a custom white balance in my camera. If I'm in the uh, rush of a wedding or some other event that's just crazy, sometimes the light might change. You don't have time to re-white balance. So if that's the case, I'll just take a quick shot of the card so I have it as a reference. Next, I take a photograph that contains both the color checker and the enhancement target. This is going to let me create a custom profile for my camera. And I have the enhancement target for a later uh, available for later adjustments should I decide I want to warm or cool my images. So now we're ready to open the images. So let's go into Lightroom. And again, I'm asking you guys to keep a close check on me. Uh, somebody just, oh, somebody just lost audio and got it back. So never mind. Uh, and again, uh, I'm going to show you some landscape images. Um, someone asks, how do I go about shooting uh, the passport in landscape shoots? Well, what I simply do is I hold it out at arm's length and take a shot of it. Um, even though the color temperature of the light may change, the spectrum of the light isn't really going to change that much. Uh, sunlight is sunlight. Now, even though it's somewhat different in shade, uh, it's not as different as you would think. I do, however, like to create profiles for different lighting conditions. I have one for my cameras for shade, one for daylight, one for my on-camera flashes, one for my studio lights, one for tungsten. And by having the combination of a profile for each of those lighting situations, along with having a white balance reference for the different lighting situations um, that I will encounter, I can then make sure I can fix it later in Lightroom. Uh, yes, custom white balance is great in camera, but sometimes you just don't have the time. So I'll take a photo of the passport, and then I, yes, I will fix it later in Lightroom. So speaking of Lightroom, let's jump in. Now again, this is Lightroom 3. Uh, it is, it's got some incredible new tools in it that I'm looking forward to sharing with you. Uh, I've been having a lot of fun with it and it's very addictive. And even though it basically operates very similarly to Lightroom 2, there's a couple of uh, new things under the hood that are very cool, which I'm gonna show you in a minute. So I've got all my images imported into Lightroom. And if I go into my library module, I can see my images. Now I've organized them two ways. I've got all of my favorite images uh, so far that I'm going to use for my book. Uh, I've got colored red. I've got 37 of them. Now I've also got one image of the passport colored red that I also gave three stars so that I can separate it out from the rest of my images and we'll see the practical application of this in a minute. So the first thing I need to do is I need to create a profile for my camera very simple to do. You simply take a picture of the target. So here is the passport. I simply go to File, Export with Preset, and when you install the software that comes with the passport, this shows up in Lightroom. Click on that, give it a name, and I'm going to call it, I'm just going to call it PM Test because, as I always like to say, like any good cooking show, I already have one in the oven for you that's ready to go. So we'll let it go through its process but I already have the profile created. And it generally takes a minute or so to do this. And what the software is doing is it's locating the target. Notice I didn't even have to white balance first. The software knows that these patches here are neutral and it will factor that in. So uh, once we've got our, our profile done, we can then apply that all to our images. Then we can do our edits in Lightroom and then we will send out our stuff to Booksmart. So again, remember our goal here uh, is to go is to get great color from our Lightroom to Booksmart stuff. So if you've seen the color uh, workflow stuff before, uh, I had to sit through it again. I apologize, but a lot of people this is new stuff, so I, that's why I asked you to uh, kind of bear with me. Okay, and all right. So my profile has been generated, and it says Lightroom needs to be restarted. Again, I have one ready for you, so no need. So let's take a look at an image that needs some edits. 
So I've got this image that's a little bit underexposed. It was a little bit heavy-handed use of a graduated neutral density filter here. So let's do some fixes on it. And the first thing I'm going to do is do a global kind of fix my exposure. Now I have two choices of doing this in Lightroom. I can either drag the exposure slider left and right, or my favorite way is to just literally go up to the histogram here and just drag my exposure so that I have it the way I want. And I pretty much have my histogram right in the right place now. Uh, also, with sometimes with my landscape images, I, I like to add a little more saturation. But before I do that, I'm going to apply the profile. So that is found underneath camera calibration. And this is the standard profile that we're provided in Lightroom. And if I click on here, you'll see I've I made one for uh, the 5D Arizona Workshop. So when I apply it, watch what happens to the sky color. That is really what the sky looked like. Also, our greens came back. The standard profile was weakening uh, the standard sky, this, the, the sky that really was there. That is the color of our image. And we can see this also if we take a look at the passport. If I bring up the white balance tool by typing W, I can sample off one of these patches. I like to come one in from the white because uh, I know I don't have to worry about exposure there. There's my white balance. Now watch the patches on the target as I apply the profile. What typically happens in most of the conversions is these blues, these purples and pinks, this brown and this green lose a lot of saturation during the standard conversion and that's causing a lot of color to be lost. So if I apply the profile, watch. See all the color we just got back? and then I white balance. So this is what we want, not the standard conversion that was costing us all that color. So by having that one click with the profile, I can now, I could actually click all my images, click on synchronize, and click on calibration, which is the profile, click on synchronize, and I just assigned that custom profile to all my images and got that color back. It's really that fast. Now, for those of you that are using program, somebody mentioned they're using Aperture, not Lightroom. Unfortunately, Aperture cannot work with this stuff. Aperture uh, works with a different color system. It works with ICC profiles, uh, which for camera profiles don't work the same way. So we're limited to the Adobe products here. This is for Lightroom and Photoshop. So again, I've got my profile assigned to all my images. Let's go back to the first image we were working on here and take a look at a couple of the other really cool things in Lightroom. Now I'm going to go ahead and zoom in actually 200% and with my navigator I'm going to come up to this area because I wanted to show you the noise that exists in this image. See all that noise in there? Not only is it noise, but I've got some color noise up in here. Well, the first really cool thing in Lightroom 3 that they've added is under the detail window, and, no, and that's called noise reduction. Now, this is a new algorithm compared to old ones. Watch what happens when I click on that. So if I bring that up to here, we just went from that to that in one click. And I know some of you are going to say, ah, oh, but you lost detail. That's right, we'll get that back in a second. Again, we've also got some color stuff going on in here. So I can reduce the color noise as well by bringing that up. And an amazing difference. So let me just turn that off again. I'll turn both of these off so you can see that's what we started with. Click on both luminance and color noise reduction and that is all gone. Now the second part is to make sure I have maintained my sharpness and most images, raw images out of the camera need sharpening. So let me go back to 100 percent and I'll show you my favorite sharpening settings which are just here. And by the way if you're a Photoshop person rather than a Lightroom person and you're using uh, say the Smart Sharpen filter uh, there's, this setting applies as well. I'll give you different numbers though. So here's what I do. I like to come up to around ooh, 80 to 100, which seems like a lot. And if you left it like this, there's a risk of getting halos uh, around the edges. However, the trick is to reduce the radius to under 1. So at 0.8, and if we take a look as we scroll around, you can see we're getting incredible sharpness on this image from the foreground as I navigate around here from the foreground parts of the image all the way back up into our little deadish tree here back to the mountain peaks. 
So if you were doing this in Photoshop, uh, the setting would be under Smart Sharpen. Try this if you haven't done this before. Use a setting of between 100 and 180 percent, but bring the radius down to about 0.8 and it will add an amazing amount of sharpness uh, without giving you the halos. It's very cool. Now also I mentioned I had uh, little overly used the graduated neutral density filter here so I've got a little bit too dark a sky up top so I'm going to use the gradient tool in uh, Lightroom and I'm going to drag down here to lighten up that sky that was a little overly dark and I can adjust this up and down by just dragging the exposure. And once I've got it kind of the way I want, I want a little bit darker up at the top, but not as dark as it was. And then I can close that. And then lastly, I mentioned most raw files and cameras are lacking a little bit in saturation. So I do like to bring it up. And in both Photoshop and Lightroom, the main difference between saturation and vibrance is vibrance increases the saturation without affecting the skin tones as much. Um, actually strangely in these sandstone, sandstones cliffs we actually got some tones that are very skin tone like so the vibrance alone although it seems to affect blue more than the saturation does uh, doesn't catch the sandstone so in this case I will both increase the vibrance and the saturation a little bit I can hide this window so we get a bigger view and we've got a nice image ready to go into our book now the other really cool thing in Lightroom 3 is its ability to fix uh, distortions and lighting issues caused by your lens. There is now a database of lenses, uh, lens profiles in essence, that are built into Lightroom. And if I click on Enable Profile Correction, uh, you're going to see this image one straighten out a little bit. Also, the corners are going to lighten. This is a 20. This was shot at 24 millimeters. And what ends up happening is you, even the best wide-angle lenses do cause a little distortion as they get to the edge. They also have a little bit of light fall off so it's very subtle here and you'll see it more obviously when I turn it off but there is a little bit of vignetting, a little darkening going on in the corners. So I click on enable profile corrections and if the, if the lens exists in the database, which in this case it does, it sees that I was shooting a Canon 24-72-8 what, just by turning this on and off you can see the difference it knows how much that lens uh, distorts on the edges and how much light fall off there is and just by that one click I get my image back the way I wanted it now if I knew that I had shot every image with this setting I did not but I'll just choose a couple just to show you uh, let's say for example I shot this grouping here I could then click sync and to my calibration and white balance I can add everything else that we just did. I can add the lens correction. I can add the noise reductions that we did both color and luminance. And I can add my sharpening. And if I had actually done exposure adjustments, I could do that as well. And then I click on synchronize and all of my images now have those fixes applied. And I could have selected all my images in groups and uh, good to go. Now, uh, bef the last thing I'm going to do is take all my images that I've got corrected and we're going to export them en masse as uh, JPEGs so that we can use them in Booksmart. Now I talked a lot about color and how important it is to have your monitor correct and how important it is to get your color set correctly on your image. However, there is one weakness to Lightroom uh, that is the domain strictly at this point of Photoshop. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you have Photoshop CS5 yet, you can be back to CS3, all of this stuff works back to uh, about CS. Um, Photoshop is the only program that will really truly show you a soft proof of an image, so you could actually see how it's going to look exactly in your book before you actually go to print. Uh, Lightroom does not have the soft proofing ability yet. We were all hoping to see it in version 3, but that did not happen. So. Right now, if I really was doing super critical work, and I really wanted to make sure that my image, uh, I wanted to see exactly what it was going to look like in the book before I printed it, in order for me to do that, I would have to soft proof in Photoshop, which is a subject for another day. Uh, we actually did do a webinar a couple weeks ago where we did go through soft proofing in Photoshop, and uh, after everything's done, you'll get an email 
uh, where the blurb folks will reference that previous webinar so you can see how the soft proofing part works. So I've got all my images selected. They're ready to go. Now I'll just simply select them all and I'm going to export them. Oh, by the way, I did not want to export the uh, color checker image. I don't want that in my book. So I had mentioned that I had created a collection differently. I created a collection for all of my images that were rated 4. Uh, so let me show you how to do that. So I go to Create Smart Collections, because it's going to know, uh, match these certain rules. So I'll call it, I'll call it 4 Part 2, because I already did this once. And so I ask it to match all of the following rules. I want my rating is, not equal or greater to, 4 stars, and click on Create and you can see now I've got 37 images colored red I've got 36 of fours part two which would eliminate out that uh, three star rating I had given to the passport because I don't want that in my book so now I can export my files so I simply go to export and I need to tell it where I want to go and I pick a folder in this case I have a folder select created already called fours for book and I would choose that and then I come down to my file settings uh, now from Lightroom the the files that we want to use for Booksmart are JPEGs and the color space that the Booksmart printer is looking for is sRGB I know there's a lot of folks that like to work in Adobe RGB or Pro Photo but for going out to our book we need to be sRGB to get our colors to match now we're not going to do any image resizing. The uh, Booksmart application will automatically fit into the uh, places we allow for images. And output sharpening, since I already did apply my sharpening in Lightroom to my images, I'm not going to add any extra sharpening to that. And after the processing, I'm not going to do anything else. I just want my images to be exported and put in this folder. And at that point, I would simply click on export. Again, I'm not going to do that because I've already done that. So now we can quit Lightroom and move into Booksmart. So let's quit this and jump into the Booksmart application, which I have on my desktop right here. And let's let that fire up and just check to see if there's any questions here. So everybody, has, uh, a couple of people ask, can you see your images in sRGB in Lightroom? Well, I'm going to guess that most of you have sRGB displays. Um, unless you have specifically gone out and purchased an Adobe RGB display, then Lightroom is actually showing you, uh, through whatever your monitor profile is, up to your display, and in mo for most of you that is sRGB or something pretty close to it. Um, and so, for, and so, as far as converting to printer profiles, that is something uh, again a subject for another day. Uh, Booksmart does not work that way. Booksmart wants JPEG sRGB files. Uh, in fact, I'm going to bring on Joe C. I'm Joe B. Joe C. is my compatriot here from Blurb on the West Coast. Uh, Joe, can you hear me? I can. Can you hear All me? Right. Joe is live. So, Joe, a couple of people were asking about sRGB versus converting to printer profiles, and uh, I mentioned that Booksmart wants sRGB JPEGs from Lightroom, uh, and that the printer profile conversions would be something for those folks using InDesign, which is a subject for another day. So, if you, if you have anything to add to that, that, that is that is completely correct. For uh, Booksmart, the sRGB is the perfect workspace. Uh, if you want to get into printer profiles, and we do recommend you work into a uh, page layout application like InDesign and use our PDF to book workflow. And like Joe said, you'll get more information on the blurb uh, color management uh, link that he'll be sending you soon. Okay, very good. Thank you, Joe. All right, so again, uh, and when you do your JPEG quality, yes, when you're going out to a book, you want to use the highest quality setting, so uh, go ahead and do that. And uh, just as a heads up, because a couple of you are asking this, if you are using InDesign or some other program, we are going to be doing a webinar specifically on producing books with InDesign, which is a completely different workflow. Uh, we will use it in concert with Photoshop. Yes, we will convert to profiles, uh, and we will bring CMYK images into InDesign, but that is a subject for another day. So, 
you don't want to set your monitor to any particular color space. You just want your monitor to be profiled and you want it to show you the best color it can. When we export our JPEGs, they are going to be uh, converted into the best color they can and it actually happens behind the scenes. It actually uses uh, perceptual rendering. Again, rendering intents, uh, soft proofing, all of that stuff is uh, Photoshop domain and we will talk about that in the future and again there is another webinar already recorded where I did do some Photoshop soft proofing and conversions that you can watch later if you missed it the first time so now we're in Booksmart so I need to start a new book and I can give it a title and I'm gonna call it since I already have a book completed for you I'll just call it Thursday afternoon and my name and I get to choose a couple of different sizes here. I got a small square, which you can see is 7 by 7, standard landscape, portrait, and large and landscapes and squares. So since this is a book about landscape photography, I'm going to do a small standard landscape book, which is 10 by 8 inches. And click on Continue. Now I then have starting points with starter layouts. And there's lots of different choices depending on the subject matter or what you think the book flow should be. Portfolio works well for uh, doing books that are a combination of photo and text, so I'm going to choose that. You also have the option to wing it. You can just start a book and you can lay out every page individually. Uh, I, I do like using the uh, starter layouts though because it does save a lot of time. And there's going to be a lot of different uh, choices we can make once we're in here. Also, I'm going to ask the software to help me add the photos. So it says, get photos from computer. So I will click on that. And here is my folder, fours for book. That's the one that we exported to. So I choose that. Now it says total selected one photo. It actually is the whole entire folder. Because when I click on continue, it's going to ask me, all right, what do you want to do with the photos? And I'm going to ask it to go ahead and automatically place the photos in my book from oldest to newest. You don't have to do this. You can drag and drop the photos in any order yourself. Again, it's a speed savings thing if your photos were organized accordingly. So I'll click continue. And one last choice is my theme. Uh, for photo books that have text, I do like having the white background. I personally find uh, black pages with text. Uh, the text can be hard to read. Uh, you also have the option of a vivid choice here, but I'm going to stick with the uh, the white pages and click on continue and off it goes so it goes out to that folder and it's going to import the 36 images that we had in here and automatically flow them into my book uh, as I ch click on each page you'll see that there are different layouts that will appear let me go ahead and make this window a little bigger as soon as it is done with its import okay that's done so let's make that fill the page here. Now, when I'm on the cover, uh, it gives me cover layouts, and I haven't put anything here yet. So let's go to the first page. And it's giving me a little triangle to tell me that this image uh, is got a little too low resolution for this container. Well, actually, that's because it is enlarged to fit the space. If I click on the image and tell it to go ahead and center it in there, you can see that this was actually a panoramic image and now the warning is gone and the same thing for the next page as well so I can just click on the image tell it to fit and I'm good to go now if I decide I want to change the layout you can see there's lots of different layouts to choose depending on what kind of page it is so if I see this panoramic well maybe I'd like to choose that layout and then tell it to refit to that size in this case, I'm going to go back to my original, click my image, and let it do that. Now, I can also edit the layout of the page. So if I click on that, it shows me the page layout in kind of a nice grid. And if I decide I want the image to be a little higher on the page, and I want this window uh, to be a little bit smaller to accommodate my uh, panoramic, but I have a lot more to say about this image. I can increase the size of my text container do too, and apply this. I also, if I'm going to do a book with a lot of panoramics, as I frequently do, I can save this to my layouts, and I will call it, I'll call it panoramic one, and then save it. So then I would always have this template available in my set of page layouts. 
Now when I preview my book page, uh, the gray areas go away, as does the holding text, and it just shows you the actual page as it's laid out, and I can zoom in and out using the slider here. It's a very, if you haven't used Booksmart before, it's a very friendly software, it's very easy to use, and it creates great books. Uh, I can also see my pages at two page spreads at a time, or the entire book. So let's do two page spreads since uh, that's a good way to work. Now in addition to all my edits, I can go ahead and add my text. I can create a cover. And since I've already got one created, let me close this one and open up a different book that I already have uh, page layouts done a little more sophisticated. I've got my cover done. So let me scroll back over to my cover. And here you see my cover. Now the flaps are only available if I use a hardcover book with a dust cover. Uh, that's where I get this, this flap area to play with. Uh, if I'm doing a soft cover, uh, you would not use these. And you actually make that choice uh, when you actually go to buy the book. Um, uh, even when you upload, it doesn't ask you. Uh, it's when you actually go to order a book that it can decide whether to be a hardcover or a soft cover. And if you choose the dust jacket and you put information in here, then that would print. So I can take a look through my images here and I've got an entire book laid out and ready to go. Now, if I'm doing full bleed like I have here on this image, I can display the trim guidelines, which will give me uh, a little dotted edge here to show that's where the trim is going to take place. But you also want to give yourself a little safety margin. You don't want to put anything really important image-wise in this pink area just to give yourself some leeway. Um, for binding reasons and for trimming reasons, just so there's a little bit of flexibility. You want to make sure that the uh, uh, live parts of your image, the important parts of your image, fit within the white space. And the last issue that comes up sometimes is when you're doing panoramics. And there's a couple ways that I've found uh, that I like to do this. And in this case, what I did was I created two pages and I simply loaded the same image into both sides. You can see that this contains the whole image and just I eyeballed uh, where the overlap was and put my image there. Same thing on this side you can see it contains the entire image. Now this is one way to do it and I, I chose to do it this way. I actually really love the way this page lined up. I've got my text over here and a, a beautiful sunrise at Lake Powell. Uh, another way to do landscapes is to actually create a left and right panel in Photoshop. Uh, what I did was I opened up my, uh, I created my panoramic in Photoshop and then cut it exactly in half and what I did was I went into one of the standard layouts and uh, adjusted that so that it worked for my panoramic and if I go to edit the layout you can see what I did was I took the standard layout which had my image right here and knowing that this was the left side I extended that right to the edge and I save this and I call it left pano and choose the right one. I would have edited the layout again, dragged this live image area completely to the left, uh, apply and save and call that pano right. So now I have those saved in my page layouts so that I can get back to this again. And again in Photoshop I simply cut the image in half and saved it as left and right panels. And then when I click on preview, I get to see the entire image. And here's another one done exactly the same way. And one last one that wasn't quite as wide that uh, I decided to do here. And I haven't quite finished this book yet. I will be doing that in the next week so that I can get it uploaded. So. I've got my book, let's say I've got my book laid out, I've put in all my text, <clears throat> I do have some more writing, and by the way, you can write anywhere. I could, I could do my writing in Microsoft Word and simply uh, dump the text into uh, the text areas of my page, and it will actually flow from page to page if I give it a lot more text and fits on one page, so that's a handy way to do it as well. So I go through my book, and there's a couple of things you need to do before you actually press the button to order the book. So let's go ahead and click on order book and we get a checklist. First of all, obviously yes, run a spell check. 
Now the problem with spell check is you might have put the wrong word in or spelled a a word that was the wrong one. Maybe you wanted to tell someone you wanted to they knew something or you know K N O W but you had N O W there. It's not going to see that as a misspell. Um, so a good idea is to print a copy of your book on your own printer, give it a look over, and really give it a second set of eyes. Have someone else look at it because we've all seen where you've read something over and over again that looks right, and you hand it to someone else and they see a spelling error. As I mentioned, keep uh, anything important to your image away from the edges. Uh, you check those safe areas and make sure uh, that they are in that safe area. Uh, obviously, make sure you own the copyright on the images. Make sure they're your own images. Or if somebody else is uh, giving you images, make sure that they have the rights to them. Uh, check your fonts. Uh, most fonts are okay, but every, every once in a while you'll come across some weird font uh, that will show up in preview uh, or on your printer. So go ahead and test that first. And once you've done this, you can then click on continue, sign in using your name and password, and when I click sign in it starts to connect to the blurb and off my book goes uh, it's now on its way and uh, seven to ten days later I get a wonderful uh, ability to order uh, one or as many books as I like as well as let other people know that the book is there if they would like to order it for themselves so I'm gonna stop this uh, so that we can continue on and let me jump back into PowerPoint and I'm going to also, uh, as, as we're summing up here, because really, our, wow, our time's just about up. Uh, let's just go ahead and uh, kind of sum up what, we're there, what we've seen. Uh, so, Joe, you're live if you have anything to add. Uh, Suzanne, uh, you can be live as well. Uh, so th what we've seen today, we've seen a combination. I've used the Passport. I used the Color Monkey to calibrate my monitor. Uh, Lightroom, I used three. Again, everything we, everything we did except for the, uh, the lens stuff and the noise stuff exists in two as well. Uh, and Booksmart, with that combination, that can be everything you need to create a great photo book with great color. Now, remember I did mention the only place to do really true soft proofing is in Photoshop. So if you're using Lightroom 3, Photoshop is still something that can be very handy. But if you follow these steps, uh, make sure your monitor is calibrated. Get your color correct right from the get-go. Uh, if you create a camera profile, you've seen how fast it is to get all the color back from your image with one click. Uh, it's a really handy tool. And you can check online to see what the Passport sells for. Uh, but wherever you look, it's going to be under $100. And I guarantee it'll pay for itself the first time you use it. So get that profile, apply it to your images, do your edits, then the next step is to export your sRGB JPEGs for placement into your Booksmart books. Uh, there is great color management uh, workflow information available uh, specific to Blurb at this link, blurb.com slash resources slash color management. There's a lot of great tools there. There's a lot of great tutorials as well. Uh, for those of you that are InDesign folks, uh, the Blurb uh, color profile is available there, as well as templates for making sure that uh, your stuff out of InDesign does work as well. Uh, again, check uh, both the Blurb and xwritephoto.com websites for educational information. There's lots of great tutorials on both sites. And I'm going to jump out of here a second, and right over this, I'm going to type in my email address for those of you that really need it. If you have something really specific to ask me that was beyond the scope of today, there's my email address. It's simply joeb at macgroupus.com. And uh, I'll do my best to uh, get your questions answered. So I'd like to thank you all for spending time with us today. Uh, I've had a great time. And we covered a lot of great information today. Put these tools to work. You'll have a great experience creating your blurb books. You'll have a lot of fun with Lightroom 3. And get your color under control. And the beautiful thing is that you'll get your right results back every time rather than have to try it multiple times to get a good print. So thanks again. Everyone have a great rest of the day, great weekend, and hope to see you online again soon. Bye, everyone.